Hi, everyone. Um, so this uh, lecture is going to cover the integumentary system. Um, so the integumentary system or your integument is essentially your skin. Okay, this is the largest system in the body. Uh, on average, it does constitute about 15 to 16 percent of your total body weight. Uh, and there are two major parts to the integumentary system. That is the cutaneous membrane, which is physically your skin. Uh, and then all of the accessory structures that can exist. So the components of the cutaneous membrane or your skin, uh, we have what's referred to as the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is going to be the outermost layer. It is very thin. Uh, it consists of about 40 to 60 layers of uh, skin cells. Um, and then you have the dermis, uh, which is going to really be a bulk of uh, connective tissue uh, versus the epidermis, which is mainly just a superficial epithelial tissue. Um, so even between the two layers of the skin, we're starting to see you know, some differences between the two main uh, types of tissues that will be present. You will also see some muscle tissue and nerve tissue uh, integrated into these layers as well. Uh, the accessory structures, they will all originate uh, from the dermis. Uh, they will extend to the epidermis, to the skin surface. Uh, and these will include your hair and hair follicles, your exocrine glands, such as sweat glands, uh, and sebaceous glands, and then your nails. Um, the integument will contain blood vessels and sensory receptors. Uh, the subcutaneous layer of your uh, tegmentary system uh, is referred to as the hypodermis. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer is actually not part of the skin. The skin is only the epidermis and dermis, okay? The hypodermis is gonna be loose connective tissue, even fat, uh, that is located below the dermis, okay? So it's below the actual uh, layer of the skin. And if you look here, uh, we can see the cutaneous uh, membrane of our skin, um, which we have the epidermis here, very thin layer, multiple layers of epithelial tissue. Uh, and then we have the dermis, which will start from about this border right here down to about this border here. Uh, and again, this is gonna be a lot of connective tissue uh, and then various other uh, types of tissue present there. Uh, and then we have our hypodermis. The hypodermis, again, the subcutaneous layer, this is not technically part of the skin. Uh, this is just a connective tissue underlying, uh, which, uh, like I said, uh, mostly will just be fat, okay? Uh, and here's just looking at a, uh, some of the accessory structures that we can find, hair, you know, your pores, uh, various types of receptors, such as tactile receptors, which would pick up pressure. Uh, nerve fibers, blood vessels, so on and so forth. So the functions of the integument is that it is involved in protection of the underlying tissues and organs, okay? Uh, we are able to excrete some uh, cellular waste products such as organic waste, salts, and we are even able to regulate uh, the removal of some water. Um, your skin will help to maintain body temperature uh, you have the production of melanin. Melanin will actually protect you against uh, the harmful effects of UV radiation. Um, the production of keratin. Uh, keratin is what actually gives your skin uh, sort of its waterproofing uh, abilities. Uh, it also provides a lot of durability to the skin. Uh, it is very, it make, essentially creates a nice, uh, impermeable uh, barrier. Uh, synthesis of vitamin D3. Uh, you have to actually be exposed to some sunlight in order to synthesize vitamin D. Uh, we have also the storage of lipids, detection of touch, pressure, pain, uh, and obviously also the coordination of the immune response, especially if there's a break in that barrier. So looking at the integumentary system here is sort of a you know a little process map that sort of gives you the, the basics of the main uh, divisions here. Uh, we have the epidermis, the dermis, and then our accessory structures. And we're gonna touch on each of these 
uh, individually, but again, this is, this is a nice figure to start off with. So looking at the epidermis, uh, this is stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, so if you remember from the last lecture, stratified means multiple layers. Squamous means flattened cells. So this would be multiple layers of flattened cells. Uh, this is an epithelial tissue. And again, another key feature of epithelial tissue is that um, with uh, epithelial tissue, it is a vascular. Okay, which means that it does not have uh, blood supply. Any of the nutrients that are required and oxygen will diffuse from the capillaries of the dermis to the epidermis. But another thing you're gonna see is as you look towards the uh, more exterior layers of the epidermis, uh, those cells are no longer living. They are actually not even going to resemble cells very much uh, anymore. Uh, they essentially are membranous sacs filled with protein called keratin, okay? All right, so the cells of the epidermis, uh, we have keratinocytes, uh, the body's most abundant epithelial cells. They contain large amounts of keratin. Um, there are two types of skin. We have what is referred to as thin skin and thick skin. Most of the skin that covers your body is thin skin, okay? And you typically will have four uh, layers of keratinocytes. Uh, thick skin covers the palms and the hands and palms of the hands and soles of the feet and you'll have five layers of keratinocytes. The reason why you have thick skin in these areas is um, just remember what these areas are responsible for. Uh, you're gonna get a lot of friction on those surfaces uh, so having a little bit of a thicker skin there is you know more beneficial than say if you think about the palms of your hands versus the tops of your hands, um, you know, you get a lot more wear and tear on that side than you do the other side. Okay, so here we can see our thin skin, okay, versus, I thought I had a picture of thick skin. I guess I don't. Um, but this is sort of layer of thin skin here. You can see really that, you know, uh, several layers here of, uh, cells. These are, you know, actively growing and active cells here, but when you get to these layers right here in the stratum corneum, these are mainly uh, dead keratinized cells at this point. All right, so there are five layers of uh, keratinocytes that we find in thick skin, okay? Uh, from the basement membrane to the free surface, it's the stratum basal, the stratum spinosum, spatum granulosum, stratum lucidum, and the stratum corneum, okay? Um, and looking at these five layers, um, you know, again, this is another great picture, and I love these little, uh, you know, breakout tables that are part of this uh, because it really just shows you uh, the, the main key points here, and it also goes over the uh, importance of those specific layers, okay? Uh, Two layers I really want you guys to be, um, you know, very mindful of here uh, is the stratum basal. This is the deepest and basal layer. This is the one that does attach to the dermal, you know, interface there. But this is also going to contain basal cells or stem cells. These are going to be the cells which make new skin, new skin cells. Okay. And then you have three layers in the middle. Um, you know, generally know why they're important. Yes, that's that's good. Uh, and then we have our stratum corneum. The stratum corneum is multiple layers of flattened, dead, interlocking keratinocytes. Okay, uh, it is water resistant. Uh, and again, the reason why it's water resistant is because of the uh, keratin that's present there. Uh, the stratum lucidum. Uh, this is that fifth layer that is only found in thick skin, okay? Uh, you will not find a stratum lucidum layer within the uh, thin skin areas of the body. So the stratum basal, this is attached to the basement membrane uh, by structures called hemidesmosomes. Uh, this was something that was covered in uh, chapter three. Uh, this forms a strong bond between the epidermis and the dermis. Uh, 
they will contain epidermal ridges that lie next to dermal papillae in the dermis. And there are many basal cells or dermative cells. Uh, these are also referred to as stem cells that will replace any of the superficial keratocytes. You have specialized structures in the stratum basal, such as tactile disc. Uh, the tactile disc, these are going to be uh, essentially receptors that will pick up pressure uh, and allow you to uh, feel touch and be able to respond to touch. Uh, so these tactile discs are essentially sensory nerve endings or sensory receptors uh, for touch, okay? Uh, within the stratum basal, you will also have the melanocytes. The melanocytes are going to be the cells that contain the pigment melanin. The stratum spinosum, this is the spiny layer. Uh, it is eight to 10 layers of keratocytes bound by desmosomes. Uh, they are produced by division of the cells from the stratum basal, some of which continue to divide in the stratum spinosum. They will contain Langerhans cells, and these are active in immune responses. So these are sort of uh, resident phagocytic cells that are sort of present in that particular area. The stratum granulosum, this is the granular layer. This is three to five layers of keratocytes. Uh, it's produced from cells of the stratum spinosum. Uh, most cells actually stop dividing and will produce keratin. Okay, uh, and at this point, when you're starting to accumulate this protein, um, what happens is you're sort of making more space and getting rid of, you know, organelles and other cell, you know, processing functions uh, so that you can fill the, this membrane sac up now with this protein called keratin. Uh, and after the production of these proteins, what happens is the cells essentially die. Uh, as you get to these more outer layers here. As I mentioned, the stratum lucidum, this is only found in thick skin, uh, and this just adds more, uh, you know, support. It's just additional layers. And then finally, we have the stratum corneum. This is exposed to the surface. As I mentioned, it is water resistant. The reason why it is water resistant is because of the keratin that is present there. Um, now you might be thinking, well, why would the cell not be water resistant? Uh, human cells, because they are animal cells, lack cell walls. Because they lack cell walls, they are not able to withstand what's called osmotic stress, which is the movement of water based on solute concentrations or osmosis. And if you were to take a human cell, such as a blood cell, and place it into water, what would happen is all the water would rush inside the cell and eventually the cell would explode, okay? Um, so it is very important to remember that animal cells do not contain cell walls. Because they do not contain those cell walls, they are uh, potentially at risk for osmotic stress, okay? The keratin is sort of helping to counteract that. That's why when you take a shower in the morning, you don't just, you know, your cells just don't explode because you are sort of a little bit of waterproof there on the surface. Uh, the stratum corneum is 15 to 30 layers of keratinized cells. Keratinization is the formation of the protective layers of the cells filled with protein keratin. Uh, new cells will move from the stratum basal to the stratum corneum, and it usually will take about seven to 10 days for a cell to sort of come from one of those basal cells, which is the stem cell, and make its way to the surface. Um, exposed cells are shed after about two weeks. Uh, water is lost from the skin in two ways with the epidermis. Uh, insensible perspiration. This is when water diffuses across the stratum corneum and evaporates from the skin. You will typically lose about a half a liter per day. And the rate increases as the stratum corneum becomes damaged, especially from burns. Uh, you know, one of the things that burn patients, and we're talking, you know, second, third degree burn patients here, is, you know, not only are they 
uh, run the risk of infections because their barrier has been significantly damaged. Their protective barrier has been damaged, but they can also, you know, die of dehydration uh, where they're, they're just losing too much uh, fluids. Sensible perspiration, this is water excreted by sweat glands, and this is in response to, you know, say, uh, overheating. Um, epidermal growth factor, this is a peptide growth factor, so it's a protein that is produced by salivary glands and, and within the duodenum. Uh, this is also used in laboratories to grow skin grafts. The functions of epidermal growth factor is to promote the division of the basal cells. It will help to accelerate keratin production, stimulates epidermal repair, and it will also stimulate glandular secretions. With the dermis, uh, this is located between the epidermis and the subcutaneous layer. Uh, it anchors epidermal accessory structures, and there are two components, the outer papillary layer and the deeper reticular layer. When we look at the dermis, again, there's two main layers here. Uh, although keep in mind that most of the skin is dermis. About, I would say 75% of the skin is dermis. Uh, it only does consist of these two layers. The papillary layer, uh, this consists of areolar connective tissue. This will contain capillaries, lymphatic vessels, and sensory neurons. Uh, they are named for their dermal papillae that project between the epidermal ridges. Uh, the papillary layer, if it becomes inflamed in dermatitis, it's referred to as dermatitis, which is typically caused by an infection, radiation, mechanical irritation, chemicals. Uh, if you've ever had the pleasure of experiencing poison ivy, you know, I grew up in South Jersey, uh, so poison ivy is definitely something that's a little bit uh, endemic to the area there. Uh, and, you know, you can also, uh, with dermatitis, uh, you get that itching or pain, redness uh, that can result. The reticular layer, this consists of dense irregular connective tissue. So the fact that we have dense irregular connective tissue there, that's giving you a nice uh, support. You can have lots of collagen elastic fibers present there. Uh, the dermis contains all cells of connective tissue proper, okay? meaning you're gonna see all the different uh, cell types that are typically present in connective tissue proper. So looking at the dermal strength and elasticity, the reason why you can sort of take your skin and pinch it and you know twist it a little and it doesn't just tear off is because we do have these collagen and elastic fibers. The collagen fibers are very strong. They're resistant to stretching. They easily are bent or twisted uh, and they can actually, you know, they do limit the flexibility to prevent tissue damage. Now your elastic fibers that are present do permit stretching and then recoil to the original length. And this does provide a little flexibility. The fibers and the water provide flexibility and resilience, which is known as uh, skin turner. Uh, damage to the skin, uh, loss of skin turner is caused by either dehydration, um, aging, hormones, and UV radiation. You know, somebody that's really uh, dehydrated, if you sort of pinch their skin, you know, you can sort of tell uh, older people will sort of lose some of this, you know, their skin's a little more loose. It's not as uh, rigid anymore, um, you know, and again, that just unfortunately comes with age. And not only is their skin not as, uh, you know, uh, rigid anymore, uh, it actually can thin up a little bit. Um, excessive distortion of the skin from pregnancy or weight gain can actually cause what's called stretch marks. Um, we also have what are referred to as tension lines. The tension lines are actually produced by parallel bundles of these collagen and elastic fibers within the dermis. Uh, they actually are what resist the forces applied to the skin. Uh, if you actually make a cut parallel to a tension line, uh, that actually will heal very well and it can actually help to reduce scarring. Uh, these cleavage lines or these tension lines are what surgeons can actually sometimes follow when they're making incisions. Uh, plastic surgeons really, really, uh, you know, 
use these tension lines to minimize scarring. Obviously, if this is a surgery and it's an emergency, they're not going to be, you know, following these tension lines necessarily. But, you know, if for plastic surgery or something, this is something that they do and can uh, take into consideration. And here you can see a image sort of looking at some of these tension lines here. So blood supply is going to be found in the dermis for the skin. Remember the epidermis is, not, is epithelial tissue and will not have blood supply. Uh, we have a few different um, things to look at for blood supply. We have the cutaneous plexus. This is a deep network of arteries along the reticular layer. And then we have what's called the subpapillary plexus. This is a network of small arteries in the papillary layer. Uh, the capillaries drain into small veins that lead to larger veins in the subcutaneous layer. When you damage blood vessels in the dermis, that will actually cause what we call a contusion or a bruise. And you can sort of see that here. We have, uh, you know, the uh, subpapillary plexus located right here. And if you see, here you actually have some of these smaller arteries or arterials sort of feeding into these uh, uh, dermal papillae, uh, which is going to help to nourish these epidermal cells here. Innervation of the skin, uh, nerve fibers in the skin, this will control blood flow, adjust gland secretion rates, monitor sensory receptors, uh, and what the sensory receptors are going to respond to is either light touch, as we see with the tactile corpuscles in the dermal papillae, or deep pressure and vibration uh, within the reticular layers where you would find these receptors. Okay, talking about the subcutaneous layer or the hypodermis, this does lie deep to the dermis. It is connected to the reticular layer by connective tissue. It does help to stabilize the position of the skin as it is an under, like an underlying layer there. It's primarily composed up of adipose tissue. Large arteries and veins are in the superficial region. This is also where if you are getting a hypodermic needle uh, or subcutaneous injections, such as diabetics inject into their belly, uh, they're sort of injecting into this fat layer of, uh, you know, when they take those injections. Um, the distribution of subcutaneous fat uh, is determined by sex hormones. And we do see some differences uh, between males and females there. Um, skin color. Uh, skin color is influenced by two pigments uh, located in the epidermis, uh, primarily two pigments. Uh, that is melanin, uh, which is gonna be your you know, brown, tan, uh, colors, and carotene, which will sort of give more of an orange uh, hue to the color. So melanin is your red, yellow, brown, black pigments. Uh, it's produced by melanocytes. Melanocytes are stored in intracellular vesicles called melasomes, which are transferred to keratinocytes. Uh, Dark-skinned people will have large, numerous melanosomes, uh, and what the melanin will do is it will help to protect the skin from UV radiation. Uh, small amounts of UV radiation are beneficial, but too much can actually damage DNA and potentially lead to uh, different types of cancers, especially skin cancers in this case. Um, Mostly everybody has the same number of melanocytes. Uh, it's just how large are these melanosomes and how much melanin pigment are you producing? Uh, some individuals will produce melanin upon exposure to UV radiation, and some individuals are just constitutively producing melanin. And the individuals that are constitutively producing melanin will sort of have a more darker skin tone than the people that are producing it only upon exposure to UV radiation. Carotene, uh, this is an orange to yellow pigment. Um, Obviously, it's something that we find in carrots uh, or other uh, orange to yellow vegetables as a pigment. Uh, carotene will accumulate in the epidermal cells deep within the dermis. 
and the subcutaneous layer. Uh, carotene can be converted to vitamin A, and it's required for the maintenance of the epithelial tissue and the synthesis of photoceptor pigments uh, located in the eye. Uh, blood flow and oxygenation can also influence skin color. Um, hemoglobin is bright red when bound to oxygen. When blood vessels dilate from heat, the skin reddens. When blood vessels flow to the skin, that decreases and the skin will actually uh, become more pale. And unfortunately, you know, if you've seen a uh, deceased body, uh, they look much more pale because they don't have that blood flow going through the skin anymore. Um, hemoglobin turns dark red when oxygen is released. Uh, this can actually result in cyanosis, which is bluish skin. Uh, this may be caused by extreme cold, heart failure, or severe asthma. Illness and skin color, uh, jaundice, this is a buildup of bile production by the liver. Uh, what happens is the skin and the whites of the eye can actually turn a little bit of a yellow color. Uh, this is something that can be seen, especially if there's liver failure. A pituitary uh, tumor, this can actually produce excess MH, MH, MSH, uh, which will actually lead to the uh, increased production of melanin. Addison's disease, this causes pituitary gland to secrete excess adrenal corticotropic hormone or ACTH. Uh, and excess ACTH will actually increase MSH as well. And vitiligo, uh, this is loss of melanocytes causing loss of uh, color in general. Um, vitamin D, this is produced by the epidermal cells in the presence of UV radiation. Liver and kidneys together convert vitamin D into calcitriol. I'm sorry, calcitriol. Uh, and calcitriol is essential for the absorption of calcium and phosphate ions by the small intestines. Uh, you must have uh, calcitriol present in order to be able to absorb calcium into the body. Insufficient vitamin D can actually cause rickets where you have lack of uh, calcium absorption, which could actually make the bones a little more brittle. Um, if you notice when you take vitamin, if anybody has taken, uh, you know, vitamin that, which is a calcium supplement, uh, and most calcium supplements will say, you know, you know, maybe 500 or a thousand milligrams of calcium, but right underneath of it, it will also say, you know, a certain amount of vitamin D is also added to that. And the reason why they add that vitamin D is to make sure that you're able to, absorb the calcium that you're taking as the vitamin. Okay, and this is just sort of showing you that connection between the production of vitamin D and how when you ingest food such as food or vitamins that contain calcium, how that calcium can be absorbed into the body. Uh, this is just showing uh, bowed legs. Bowed legs is you know very common with uh, rickets. Um, this is not something that you should see in the United States. Uh, you know, we uh, do not have that level of malnourishment of uh, children uh, during their development years. Uh, but in a lot of developing countries, this is still something that uh, is very possible. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to break up the integumentary system into two parts. Uh, and... The first part I wanted to actually talk about the skin structure itself, which is everything up to this point. Uh, the second part will deal with the accessory structures. And I'll, I will try to get that up today. If not, I promise I'll have it up tomorrow morning. Okay, uh, have a good one guys.